Okay. So um, again, we'll we'll take care of homework questions next box, and I'll post solutions on on Canvas. Um, I want to circle back on even and odd functions because we didn't quite get to. Uh, we, we talked about how to algebraically check if something's even or odd. We didn't talk about the important properties of even and odd. Um, and it has to do with symmetry. Um, let's really quickly remind ourselves what's the rule for even and odd functions. Remember, it's kind of the same thing at the beginning. We're taking f of the opposite of x. Even functions are special functions where what do you get when you do that? You end up getting the original function, right? So you plug in negative x, you end up getting the original function. Odd functions are special and that when you plug in the opposite of an input, you get close. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, and this is starting to link to symmetry. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about the, that. Well, I guess we'll, we'll get into it right now. Um, this is an example of an even function. What kind of symmetry are you seeing in this graph? It's symmetrical about the y-axis. The cubic function, the cubic third function is an example of an odd function. It also has symmetry about, we you know this one, it's about a point, a very special point, the origin. Symmetry about the origin, if you think back to geometry, do you remember talking about uh, rotational symmetry? If you take a figure and you rotate it, so symmetry about the origin, another way to think of it is, if I rotate this figure 180 degrees, if I flip it upside down, will it look exactly the same? Um, and, the, and odd functions will have that type of symmetry. Now, what is to make a connection between what's going on here in the rule and the symmetry here, okay? This is kind of a, this is a big bite. So you're ready? All right, what this says is if I take two inputs, they're not the same input, but they're the same value as one's positive and one's negative, right? So if I take two X values, one's positive and one's negative, and I plug it into the function, how are the Y values of those two things gonna relate to each other? I'd say this is telling us that the y values are going to be equal, right? So if I take two x inputs and plug them into my function, I'm going to get y values that are equal to each other. Graphically, I'm going to pick an x value, say somewhere between one and two. I'm just going to call it x. And then I'm going to pick a, another x value that's the same value, but the opposite sign. So it would also be between, but this time negative one and negative two, and this would be negative x. And if I compare my output, my y values for those two x values, what is true about those two y values? They are the same. The y coordinates of those two points are the same. And if we want to be able to pull the graph over the y-axis and get it to match up onto itself, we want it to have that symmetry about the y-axis, this would need to be true, right? If I pick an x value over here and an x value in the exact opposite spot, I need those y coordinates to be the same so that when I fold it, they match up with one another. So do you see how this rule relates to exactly what's going on in that graph? I plug in an x value, I plug in a negative x value, I'm going to get the same y value. All right, now the same thing happening here. I plug in an X value and a negative X value. Am I gonna get the same Y value? Not exactly the same. They're gonna be a little bit different. How will they be different? One of my Y values will be positive and the other one will be negative. The same value, but just the negative version of it. So again, looking at this graphically, if I pick an X value somewhere between one and two, and then I pick another X value same distance away, but on the opposite side of the origin. And I look at the y values that I get out of that. 
in one case I'm getting about positive 3, in the other case I'm getting about negative 3. That y value is almost identical, it's just that it's in the opposite direction. One is positive and one is negative. Uh, big thing I need you to know is that um, even functions have symmetry about the y-axis, odd functions have symmetry about the origin. There was one problem in our homework that was tricky. Um, if you tried to do it graphically, that was integral of the 0 0.03, number 51. Number 51, and the answer in the back of the book is incorrect for that one, but that happens occasionally. Some, some of your books might have that answer scratched out. Number 51 was neither. You should have gotten either, and the book says that it's even. And if you were to graph it in your calculator, it would almost look symmetric. I mean, it would totally look symmetric. But that 0.03 in there would make it so that it was just shifted over a tiny little bit. It's not actually symmetric. Right. All right. So what we're going to be doing today, we're just going to be checking even and odd visually. If it's symmetric about the y-axis, we're going to say it's even. If it's symmetric about the origin, we'll say it's odd. All right, and that wraps up section 1.2. So we've now spent about three and a bit uh, classes on that. We're ready to move on to 1.3. You guys ready for this? So I'm gonna, let me give you a heads up on what's going to happen here. Um, 1.3, you're going to be doing some self-study on the 12 parent functions. The book calls them 12 basic functions. But really what you're going to be doing is practicing all the stuff you did in 1.2. Okay, so you're going to be looking at graphs and saying, is it bounded above, below, or, or both, or neither? You're going to be looking at graphs and saying, is it continuous? Are there horizontal and vertical asymptotes, and where are they? Mostly graphically. Mostly you'll be doing this graphically. Um, you'll be looking at graphs and saying, is there some symmetry? And if there is symmetry, does that mean this function is even or odd? Um, a lot of that kind of stuff. So when you do the homework for this, it's going to be, there's not a whole lot of work to show for a lot of them. We will also be graphing piecewise defined functions, and we'll get into that today. Um, before we do, though, let's talk about edge behavior and how we do this using limit notation. Um, I was pleased to hear yesterday that this is something that you are somewhat familiar with, if maybe this limit notation. But let's just make sure, okay? If I talk about the end behavior of a graph, are we comfortable knowing that that means I'm talking about what's happening at the far left-hand side of the graph and the far right-hand side? Usually there are arrows that indicate this. Have you heard of this before? Like, I'm talking about what's happened on the left, what's happening on the right, what's happening on the left, what's happening on the right. That's the end behavior, right? If I asked you to describe in words what's happening on the far left of this graph, you would, I would say on the far left, the graph is doing what? Is it going up, is it going down, or is it headed toward a particular value? I look at this, I see that it's, is it going up, is it going down, or is it headed towards a particular value? I would say it's going up. We have this fancy limit notation that I'm going to ask you to get comfortable with. And I think you've seen something, if not identical to this, similar to it. This is how I would translate this into limit notation for free calculus. And you would be using something similar in calculus. Does that look familiar? No. Okay. Have you seen the X arrow negative infinity piece before? All right. Some of you have, some of you haven't. I'm seeing some head shake both directions. So so here's the thing that I need you to kind of wrap your head around. This, this, is, this is just notation. It means exactly what this sentence says up above it, not sentence, but words. When we say left, are you able to, in your mind, especially far left, 
Are you able to make a connection between X heading towards negative infinity? If X is heading towards negative infinity, that's way, way out on the left, correct? And when I say it's going up, up is in the Y direction. Are you able to make a connection to F of X equals infinity? That's the Y going way up, right? So it's just a notation about what's going on at the ends of the graph. It looks a little bit weird. Um, it may look a little bit weird at first, but you'll get used to it. You'll get to the point where you can just like look at a graph and write this. But for right now, you might want to make yourself some notes in words to kind of help you. So let's think through this second one. Um, actually, we need to finish this up because we haven't done the other side of the graph. We did this side. Let's do the other side of the graph. So on the far right, It's going, well, it's going up again on the far right. So see if you can translate that into limit notation. On the far right, it's going up. I'll get it set up for you there. So all you got to do is fill in some infinities or negative infinities. <laughs> All right, so LIM stands for limits. And I don't want to get too heavy into that because that starts getting into calculus. So calculus is all about limits. So the calculus is all about what happens when things get really, really, really tiny. Um, and so the, you'll learn a lot about limits in the first few weeks of calculus. But basically, X can never get to infinity, right? And Y can never equal infinity. This is saying the limit as it gets closer and closer and closer to infinity. Okay, so it's acknowledging the fact that yes, nothing can actually equal infinity, but it's getting awfully close to it. That's that's sort of in a nutshell what it means. All right, so when we see far right, are we comfortable saying that's X heading to positive infinity this time? And when we see going up, are we comfortable saying that the y value is going to positive infinity? Y goes up towards infinity. So I'm going to challenge you to see if you can fill out the rest of these if you haven't already. Hey, let me give you a, a really cool hint. This helps me a lot when I've got to do something involving weird notation. Anytime you're asked for n behavior, there is a certain portion that is 100% always going to look the same. You're always going to write that. And you're always going to write this. The only thing that will ever change is what comes after that equal sign. So a strategy that I use a lot when I'm dealing with something with weird notation is I will write down the notation first, and then I will come back and think my way through, OK, let's fill in the blanks in this. That way I'm not trying to do two things at one time. Yes. Yes. That is the way we write it because somebody a long time ago decided that's the way we were gonna do it. And the whole community has agreed that that's, that is the notation. And the arrow is pronounced approaches. So we would say that as the limit as X approaches negative infinity of F of X is, and then whatever comes after it. Question? Uh, one of these is going to be negative infinity, yes. You're correct. Because I can see the graphs going up on one side and down on the other side. So I should have a positive infinity and a negative infinity. It's going up on the left hand side. Left hand would be X heading negative, right? So this would be our positive or our negative. It would be a positive because we're going up on the left. We're going down on the right. The right would be when X is going to positive infinity and we're going down so that would be negative infinity does anyone else use this strategy of like building out the format first and then filling in the numbers later 
I use it constantly. If I got to do the quadratic formula, I always draw out the the radical and put parentheses squared minus four times parentheses parentheses all over two parentheses, and then I'll come back and fill in the numbers. If I try and do all that stuff at one time, I'll mix something up. This one's a little bit different. Our y values are not heading to infinity. The x values are heading towards infinity, but the y values are kind of leveling out along those asymptotes. So this is actually going to be a number. What number, what y value is it getting really close to as we head off to the left? Two. And on the right, same. So if there's a horizontal asymptote, then usually your end behavior is going to head towards that horizontal asymptote. Can you guys show me on your thumb ears how you're feeling about this right now? It's weird. It may be unfamiliar notation, but are you understanding the concept of what I mean by end behavior? What's going on way out there? What's going on way out here? Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we heading towards some constant value? All right. Let's flip the page. Okay, we got to step on the gas because we have to get all of this done this period. This one. It's not going to happen. Okay. This is the part where I'm going to ask you to be doing this. is going to be part of your work for today. Okay. Um, under normal circumstances, I would give you time in class. You just don't have it today because of the half day. But just go, go hang out this afternoon at the Starbucks with your buddies and get it done. Just extra, extra class time. Um, we'll do one of them together. So basically, what I need you to do is I need you to be really familiar with the 12 basic functions. Um, I'll refer to these as the parent functions. The book doesn't use that terminology, um, but I've seen it used a lot before. These are like the most simple functions and what are their shapes? And then what we're going to eventually do with these is do transformations on them. And I am told that you spent a lot of time on transformations last year. So I'm excited for that. That's coming up uh, next week and I'm guessing it's going to go really well for us. Um, but we need to be familiar with what all of the the starter functions look like and the properties of those before we start doing transformations and then we can stretch them and shift them and flip them and all that other fun stuff that we do with transformations okay so i'd be happy to do one of these with you um i'd say probably we don't want to do something super simple um i did we did uh the reciprocal function in class yesterday so let's not do that um I don't know. What do you guys want to do? You want to do uh, e to the x, the exponential? Why don't we do that one? I think that'd be a good one. Um, and in your book, you might make a note of this. They do one of them for you. Uh, they do the absolute value, and that's on page 112. If you get confused on any of these, by the way, If you get confused on any of these, make sure you're looking at the book, okay? There is information in the book that's going to help you. This greatest integer function, they show you what the graph looks like right in the book, okay? Same thing with the logistic function. They show you what the graph looks like. So have the book open while you're doing this. It's going to help you with it. Uh, but let's run through the uh, exponential function together right now as a class. Um, let's get some points on our graph for this. So e to the x, uh, important point here, it definitely goes through 0 comma 1 because e to the 0 power, anything to the 0 power is 1. Um, and then it's, it's an exponential graph. e is about 2 point something. I should know better than that. Uh, yeah, 2 point something-ish. So we'll say there's a point right there. And it's just going to kind of do this and this as exponential graphs tend to do. Chapter three is all about exponential and logarithmic functions, so we'll be graphing lots of these then. Domain. Domain for an exponential function. We can plug anything we want into an exponent, right? Positive, negative, zeros. So the domain would be all real numbers. Same for range. 
No, we're never going to get negatives. And we're never going to get zero. But zero to infinity, yeah. And I can tell by looking at this graph, it's kind of, it's coming down, it's getting really close to zero, but it's never going to touch it. There's an asymptote there. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, in terms of increasing or decreasing, this graph is only doing one of them, and it's doing it for the entire graph. What is it doing? It is increasing. So it doesn't decrease at all. That would be the empty set. It increases over the entire function, which was all real numbers. Exponential graphs do not have symmetry. So what does that tell us about odd even neither? Yeah, so exponential graph is not odd. And it's not even. Because the, it, would have, it would have to have some kind of symmetry to be one or the other of those. Continuous, yes or no? No breaks, no jumps. Now, I got some questions yesterday, so I just wanted to pass this along. Um, actually, let's just do it right here. Uh, it was always about this one. The one right next to it, it, it is continuous. So I just write yes there. When you get to that, you might be wondering whether the, uh, the square root function is continuous or not. It does not have to cover the entire graph to be continuous it just needs to be smooth with no breaks or jumps. Wherever it is, it's got to be smooth. All right, back to exponential plus you. Is it bounded? It's, so it's not bounded overall, but it is bounded below. And when you do bounded in general, say, um, like not bounded above, not bounded below, or just none, I guess. Too specific. Local extrema, these would be dips in the graph or bumps in the graph. Are there any spots where it's going down on both sides or going up on both sides? Let's see, no. No local maximas and local mins. Other asymptotes, there is one. Let's try to put it on the graph. Or else I have to do this on the exact same site. Please, as you're working through these, um, get in the habit of giving me equations for asymptotes. Asymptotes are not numbers, they're equations. When I ask you on a test for the horizontal asymptotes, just don't just say zero. You're going to lose lose little half points for stuff like that. It's a line, so lines get equations. Points get coordinates. Lines get equations. Uh, and behavior. Hey, let's practice what we just did. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up my format. That's always the same. And then I'll still go back and fill in. After the equals. So what's happening on the far left of this graph? Is it going up, is it going down, or is it headed towards a value? Yeah, so I'd say on the far left of this graph, it's not diving up or down, it's headed, it's flattening out to zero. So this would be zero for the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side of my graph, is it heading up, heading down, or leveling out at a value? Looks like it's going up forever, so this would be infinity over here. All right, 
So I'm going to ask you to do that for all 12 functions. I do want to show you the textbook. They are all listed and graphed, and they've got some information about them. Um, again, this is going to be an opportunity for you to practice just with those concepts of domain and range and asymptotes and bounded and all that fun stuff. Should not take you a super long time. Okay, you're probably looking at maybe 20 minutes to complete that. All right. All right. We, I, I, I wish that I could provide you class time um, to do it, but I'm going to ask you to, to do that on your other class time. And then we're going to do one more thing together here today. Yes. Uh, that began, it's 1.3 and it begins on page 106. This is a pretty long section. Um, if you, just to kind of show you, if you are having trouble, again, I, I hope that if you're not the type of person who in the past ever used the book for anything except for problems, I hope that you'll, if you get stuck, look at the book. Um, in the examples, they basically take you through all that stuff that we just did. They show you an example of how to find the domain. They show you an example of how to find continuity. They show you an example of how to find boundedness. So it kind of rehashes everything that we've already learned. Um, and it's, it, it goes through, it's pretty thorough about how to look for all the stuff that we just talked about. So if there's something that's confusing you, please look through those examples. I think the book does an excellent job of doing it. And it's written by a, a couple of uh, uh, fellow alumni of the Ohio State University. So it's gotta be awesome, right? You know I was a Buckeye? I apologize, April. I do hate the B thing. You know what I'm talking about? People say they, when people say Ohio State University, people like, no, the Ohio State University, which is just a nice thing to call us. But I am a proud Buckeye. All right. Last up piecewise defined functions. Yes, no, have you seen this? All right, do you know what a chimera is? Ancient Greek mythological creature. Anybody know what parts, animal parts make up a chimera? What's in a chimera? <laughs> you might be thinking of Cerebus. Cerebus is a three-headed dog. I mean, okay, maybe it does. Dragon or a snake, yeah. And I've seen it drawn also as the tail of the snake. The tail is a snake's head. And the body is, it definitely has a lion's head on it. And the body is a goat, or maybe it's got a goat head. Anyways, it's a bunch of animals that they stuck together, and it sounds terrifying, right? So that's what that's what these are. And but this is the function version of this. So we're going to take a bunch of other functions, a bunch of pieces of other functions, not even the whole function, just pieces of them. And we're going to cram all these together and sew them together into one terrifying, majestic, uh, piecewise defined function. Okay. So that's all this is. Basically, we're going to end up with one, two, three different graphs, and we're going to skip, sit, skip, ah stitch together various parts of them. Typically when I do this, I won't do a scratch graph and a final graph, but I thought for the sake of our notes, it might be helpful to have those two things side by side. Usually I would just do this in pencil and then kind of erase the pieces that I don't need. Okay, but we'll go ahead and, and, and do both. So we are gonna graph three different graphs, one scratch graph, and then we'll draw our final graph afterwards. So let's get started here. My first graph has the equation y equals x squared. So go ahead and draw me that function. You should be very familiar with this function. If you're not, it's one of the ones that you're going to be doing in the work that we just talked about, right? That's our current function for quadratic. Two, four, negative two, four. And I'm going to draw kind of dashed lines here. It doesn't really matter. Now, we're not going to keep that whole function. Remember, we're going to chop a piece of it off and sew it on with the other pieces. There's that one. My second function is y equals 1. That should be pretty quick to draw. 
with the horizontal line. And my third function is y equals x plus one. Now we can't sew the entire entirety of all three of those functions together because, well, what we'd get wouldn't be a function, wouldn't it? it would, that would totally not pass the vertical line test if I tried to, to make all of those pieces into one function. So we're only gonna keep certain pieces of it and that is sold to us by what's the, this is, these are known as the subdomains. So we're only gonna keep x squared for values of x that are less than one. We're gonna chop the rest of it up. So we're gonna we're not gonna keep at one, but we're gonna keep the rest of this over here. So I'm gonna darken this in. We're gonna keep that piece of our parameter. Toss out the rest. Subdomain for the horizontal line, we're only gonna keep the part of it that falls between one and two. And we'll keep what happens at one, but not what happens at two. So we got a solid. And open dot, and we're just keeping this little one little piece of it right there. And then our diagonal line, we're keeping only the portion of that where x is greater than or equal to two. So we'll start here, keep it at two, and we'll keep this portion that keeps going on there forever. Say again, a continuous version of it. So it's, it's a interesting question. Is it gonna be continuous? Oh, are you saying, could you make a continuous piecewise defined function? Yes, you can. This one has definitely has a discontinuity in it though, right? So this is a pre-calc topic, but it's basically like three algebra one problems in one, right? You're just basically combining three graphing problems into one problem. So it'll be, again, a good opportunity for you to practice graphing on the, the basic functions that you're gonna be filling out through packet with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the bottom half of this for right now. How are we doing on time? So, we actually have time left over. Okay. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, any questions about anything we did today? We totally have time for homework questions. So, I'm not going to check your homework today. I will check. I will check it. You're getting points for it. But I'll check two homework assignments on Friday. Mm -hmm. Sure. Found it on the domain. Uh, the, on the domain is kind of asks for information. They're asking you. So, there, another way to state the question: What is bounded? If is the graph bounded on the domain? Would be to break it up into its pieces. Is it bounded above? Is it bounded below? And is it bounded? So as long as you can answer those three questions. So if they ask, if they ask this for this one, they, if they said, is this graph, determine whether this graph is bounded on its domain. I would say it is bounded below. It is not bounded above. It is not bounded. Okay, thanks for that question. Yeah, basically they're saying, so I don't, the on the domain thing, if they, they could ask a more complicated question would be, is this graph bounded over the interval negative one to positive one? Then I would say, yes, it's bounded below. 
Yes, it is bounded above. If they say only over the interval negative one to positive one, we're only looking at that portion of it. And now it is bounded above. Do you see the difference between that? So if I if they if they said instead of on the domain, they said on the interval from negative one to positive one, that changes your answer. Because now you're not looking at the whole graph, you're only looking at a small piece of it. Thanks for that. Any other questions on homework? Yeah. I believe you said it's in It's incorrect. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to guess that. Uh, I'm going to guess that that was Foley who wrote the answer to that one. Definitely not the monarch. <laughs> there are mistakes in the book. Well, I'm not checking it today, so you lucked out. So. <laughs> you got an extra couple of days to get them done. Um, okay, yeah, let's let me double check here. Let me freeze and not show. Oh, I got to take a time. Um, and I, I'm still answering. If you folks, if you don't have questions, you want to just be working on that, that packet, that's fine. Victoria, not here. Uh, hang on, I'll get, I'll, I'll get you just a second. If I don't do this now, I'm going to forget. Save these out. Okay, homework question. Okay, so, um, 